meeting. <laughs> All right. Sounds good, Jim. Well, um, you know, I don't usually do these kind of presentations, but uh, this is pretty much fun. I, I really enjoy uh, doing these Red. kind of things. Um, What's your email? I suggest everybody mute their their uh, F, devices wait, wait, if you can. Hold it, hold it, hold it. F, F, uh, Dylan, you can. There we go. Yeah, mute all. <laughs> yeah, Dylan can do that. Yeah. Anyway, um, I am on the West Coast. Uh, I have been doing ON30 modeling now for about seven years, I guess. Uh, as a kid, I, I really uh, started into model trains pretty young and then learned about girls and model airplanes and all kinds of other things, cars, and sort of departed from that until probably my mid 40s. Uh, went into ON, HON3 for a while and then uh, had kids and gave that up and got back into ON30 again, like I said, about seven years ago. So strictly an ON30 modular railroader. I don't even have a layout at home. Uh, so, you know, for what that's worth, I love detailing stuff. Uh, weathering and detailing is really my thing. I'm gonna show you some, uh, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation and hopefully we can share this. And I'm not, this is, this is not a presentation. You guys interrupt me with questions. That's the best way to do these kind of things. So feel free to interrupt as we go along here. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see a title screen. Can you, yay nay? Yeah, we can see it, Kevin. Looks right, good. Cool. Um, so I started, I, I have two lines. I have the Pudding River Lumber Company and the Oregon, California and Western Railroad that I model. Uh, Pudding River Lumber Company has been my focus for a long time. I come from the Pacific Northwest and really model in that uh, vernacular. Uh, I love logging railroads. I love everything about kind of the, the casual backwoods narrow gauge. Um, so this is, for those of you who don't already know, this is one of our layouts. I belong to the California South Coast uh, ON30 modular group. We set up at train shows, usually about a 40 by 40 layout. And that's me right there, that, uh, that uh, U-shaped part of the uh, layout. So I have about eight or so uh, modules. Um, this is us setting up, we set up at the National Narrow Gauge Convention in 2013, and this was my first convention actually, and we had 66 modules, took about, uh, I think about 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes to get from one end to the other at scale speed. I'm going to try to play this video. This is the views of some of my modules. This is the Shelter Cove module. Um, it's a uh, seaport town and uh, it's about eight feet long and at the widest 30 inches wide. Um, got several structures. The boats are a collaborative effort. Um, one of the gentlemen in our group cast the holes. Um, I, I built some of the superstructure and painted and weathered them. Everything else that you see is, is pretty much my work. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of these things a little bit more. I love, like I said, I love detailing. So there's a little hobo camp. I do a lot of lighting animations. So there's a, you know, a fire. I, most of my buildings are lit uh, internally, if not externally. Um, this particular module is not mine, uh, this corner module. So this picks up again on some of my work. This is a, uh, this is a, oh, what is it? I forget the manufacturer, it's a plastic kit. Um, 
and it's been weathered and modified slightly. There's uh, docks front and back, signage, et cetera. Not a lot of change to this, but it doesn't look anything like it comes from the uh, from the manufacturer. I think it's SunSuite Company or something like that. And Al, you might recognize that white building. That's one of yours. I bought that from Al probably as I, just as I was starting and uh, weathered it more than it was already weathered, uh, added signage and details, et cetera. And this corner is called Riverton. Um, whoops. Apologies. We'll get back to it here. This is Riverton. It was really designed as an interchange between river traffic and the railroad. Uh, so there's a, a big dock, um, uh, train troll, uh, uh, boat, river boat, stern wheeler. Now this isn't working for me guys, sorry. I'm just going to move on. Um, Kevin, do I see some seagulls flying over the water there? Pelicans. Yes, you do. Um, Are they on a pen or? Yeah, let me let me get to that. They're right here. There is a simple wire that goes from the uh, water up to the belly of the pelican, and it's painted black, so you really don't even see it. Uh, they look like they're flying over the water. I do a lot of birds. You'll you'll see like on on the ridges of uh, most of my buildings, I've got pigeons sitting, and uh, a lot of bird poop on my roofs too. I, it's something that I grew up with, and uh, never seen anybody else model, but it adds a lot of realism to your buildings. So there's the uh, Riverton scene again. It's uh, got a siding with a mercantile building, a, uh, a salvage yard, a contractor, Stanley contractor. That's a Mount Albert kit and a slight modifications to that. Um, scratch built uh, uh, storage shed. I, I fill my scenes with detail. You can probably see that. To me, that's what brings a model railroad alive. Um, I know a lot of people aren't into that, but that's really what I love doing is creating detail and creating realistic environments. Yeah, I'm froze up here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of that for a second. Um, try and reshare it. Technology is too complicated here. Technology is fantastic until it doesn't work. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Well, let's see. Your water is very impressive. That's Bend in Oregon. That's my I, my uncle lived there. I spent a lot of time on that beach. I'll just get out of it all together and try and restart it. There we go. Might be easier. Yeah, just blame this on the convention. Pardon? Pardon? Just blame this on the convention committee. It's all their fault. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it this way because it'll take less uh, bandwidth, I think, to push it through. You guys can see these images okay? Um, I can't see anything. Is... I don't see your face. Oh, you just see my face? Hold yeah, on. It's fine. It's just... <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so photogenic, right? Yeah. Now you should see it. There it goes. Yep, that's it. Got it. Yep, got it. So this is the first modules I ever built. This is the Pudding River Lumber Company engine house. This is a uh, Crystal River kit, I think. They're no longer in production. It's a great little kit. Um, really went kind of crazy detailing it. Um, this is the interior. So it's got lights and stuff everywhere. Um, really again i really enjoy the the super detailing this is actually shot i also do a lot of photography um, so this is actually shot on the module because you can see the uh herbert shirley uh, uh construction yard in the background there and then this is the uh interior with the roof off it's funny I, when i go to shows and whatnot i i usually leave the roof on so people never see this <laughs> Kevin, where do you get a lot of your detail parts? Everywhere. Um, I a lot of the gears and, and parts and pieces are. I, I used to buy watch parts in like by the baggie full. They were available on eBay really cheap for a while. Nowadays they're pretty hard to find. But a lot of the gears and parts and pieces are just watch parts. Um, I pull from marine sellers in the uk i pull from you know kitschy parts uh any place i can find something that i think works i will uh, try and pick it up i don't know if you can see in the background well you probably can't see my image right now but behind me up here i've got a whole cabinet full of plastic boxes full of parts and pieces of stuff that I've accumulated over the years. So this is kind of where I start. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you know, I do just stupid little doodles at lunch that eventually through a process of actually, in this case, a couple years, uh, turn into modules. So the Pudding River group of modules is two modules about eight feet long and 24 inches wide. It comprises a warehouse building, a repair shed, and an engine house. I also love doing water, which I'll be happy to talk to you guys about if you're interested. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very interested on in how you do your water. Okay, great. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit later, Tom, in this, uh, I'll try and get through these slides quick. Um, again, just some images. That's, again, the Riverton module. Um, another view of the Riverton module. That's the Pudding River engine house that looks out over the construction yard. Another view. I, again, another uh, little sketch here. Apologize for the title and then, uh, you know again I just sit down at lunch and freehand sketch these things looking at how it fits on the plan that little three inch by four inch square turned into this building right here <laughs> just trying to generate ideas question and again the shelter cove modules um, normally these don't show with a background uh, I do the backgrounds for photography, and this got actually printed in the ON30 annual, I think in 2017. Uh, we did a, I did an article with Dane Lees on this. Another view. And so Jim wanted me to talk a little bit about uh, how to, how I do landscape and whatnot, and I could probably spend way too many hours doing that um, but I like I said the detail are, of my environments are very dependent upon a lot of natural scenery 
So I spent a lot of time on trees and bushes and grass and stumps and all kinds of things. Um, I do a lot of ferns because I'm modeling the Pacific Northwest. Um, these are goose feathers that are dyed and I take them and twist a little bunch of them together at the bottom, put a little hot glue on them, stick them on a, a cake pan and pull them off as I need to as I'm sticking them on my modules. Uh, you, can, you can buy the goose feathers dyed for, I don't know, five, six dollars a bag and it'll last you for a very long time. I still have my original bags. Um, I do a lot of resin cast stumps. Uh, again, this is a logging era kind of layout. So I take the resin cast stumps, which usually don't have a very strong engagement with the terrain and do root structures and that becomes that on the layout. <clears throat> And trees, uh, this is some windswept kind of seacoast trees. I go out in the, in the desert and gather up sagebrush. Um, I use a, a, a furnace filter material as the base and then uh, just paint it black and then sprinkle it with a little bit of ground foam uh, to get the effect I want. And then these are O scale trees. That tree right there is about 24 inches tall and um, in this image you can kind of see the progression from a this in this case I use both dowels and uh, cast resin uh, trunks in this case I got these trunks from uh, Andy at uh, Grand Central Gems but you start with the raw stump I, I put in uh, deadfall or, or dead limbs at the bottom, uh, paint it black, go over it with a gray, and then I take the furnace filter material and I cut it into uh, kind of star-shaped, star-esque pieces, um, paint that black, tease it out, and then use two colors of ground foam um, to uh, finish it out. There's a, a dark ground foam and then a lighter ground foam on the top to highlight the top surfaces of the trees. I've shown a couple guys in our group how to do it. It's not really hard. It's just incredibly time consuming, uh, especially the this part of cutting these things out because there might be 20 of them on a tree that's O scale and 24 inches tall. When, when was the last time you made trees, Kevin? Oh, probably six or eight months ago. I got too many trees. My whole basement's full of trees stuck in foam. Because <laughs> all this stuff is removable. You know, everything that you see on this on these modules has to be taken off for transport. I remember so, when I last time, the last show I helped you tear down, I, it, it was, looked like a completely different scene with all the trees removed. Yeah, yeah. But all the buildings come off, the trees come off, everything comes off uh, that's over about an inch and a half tall. Um, let's see, I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is, this is all the same module. Actually, one of the more recent ones I did. How do you protect your trees when you're transporting them? Um, I have a slab of foam that's two inch foam by about eight inches by probably 24. And I, each of these trees has a nail in the bottom of it. So it actually sticks into the, the foam that's on the layout. And uh, I just pull the trees off and stick them in there. And I have a big enough vehicle that I don't really need to protect them per se. I just need to make sure they're not, you know, falling around and jumping around in the car. Hey, Kevin, do all the trees go in a specific spot or do you just put them on randomly? You know, how do you remember where they go or is that even important to the layout? <laughs> yeah, good, good question, Tim. Um, they do have a specific spot. Um, I, I have a color code on the bottom of them. There's a, a, like two blue dots or one red dot. Uh, each tree has a color code and there's a corresponding color code on the, on the module. It still takes a long time to figure out where they go, but yeah. you know, they do have a specific place to go. 
Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I, I do a lot of terrain development. I don't like flat layouts unless you're modeling Nebraska and nothing's <laughs> flat. Um, so, you know, even if it's inch or inch and a half of, of variation in the height of your terrain as your railroad goes through it, um, I, I spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. So this is actually the base for this little scene right here. So that's about an inch and a half higher than the track as it goes around. And this is one of my more recent uh, modules that I've been working on. Kind of a group effort. One of the guys built the, the trestle components. Um, one of the other gentlemen built the frame and I did everything else. But this was a, a trestle module that's supposed to mimic the Carrizo Gorge um, environment. And I tried a couple new techniques that I'd never tried before on this. I used uh, sculptural foam here in, I live in Glendale and that's close to Hollywood and there's, they use a lot of this foam material uh, in movie theater or movie sets. And it's a very carvable product. It makes a horrible mess, <laughs> uh, but it's very, you can almost carve it with your hands by, by rubbing it, you know, and, and creating contours and whatnot. And I built all of this over um, Joel Bragdon's uh, hard shell scenery system. So basically what you're seeing here, this, this little area right here is Joel's hard shell scenery. It's basically a resin with a window screen, makes a really hard, very lightweight base. Um, and then I start, you know, just throwing blocks of foam at the, at the environment and eventually uh, smoothing them out, you know, creating kind of the rounded shapes that are evident in uh, Carrizo Gorge. And this is kind of more of this, oh, and then I, I use Joel's uh, system for uh, rock castings, which is another resin-based and foam system. Not the easiest system to work with, but turns out some nice details. And I use that on the, for the blasted surfaces around the trestle. Um, this is just how I do the faces. I, I have a little laminate um, router that I use to contour the faces of the of these modules, and that's what it looks like as a finished product. I could go into great detail about how you paint these things. Um, Joel's system uses a gesso overcoat over all his casting. So I use that on everything and it actually was really helpful. I, I, I think you can kind of see it here. It's, it's this white surface. Um, just as what's used for um, a base on oil paintings. Uh, or, or artists that are doing oil paintings use it to prep their canvas. And so it, it creates a much denser surface on the, on the rocks than just what the foam would be. And then there's probably six different washes of color over these uh, rocks. I start with a, a tempera, a black tempera powder and you just lay powder over everything again, makes a terrible mess. And then you wash most of that off, but it gets down in the cracks and creates the shadow and shading uh, effect. I've also uh, used uh, India ink solutions, but the, uh, the tempera creates a much deeper shadow in, in some of these uh, crevices and whatnot. Does the gesso uh, absorb kind of the gesso bonds really well to the subsurface and it it's not highly absorptive. It's kind of like a dense plaster in a way. I mean, it's very, very thin, but it sort of ends up almost as a, a plaster-like surface. So it'll absorb color really well. 
Hey, Kevin, how much did that, that uh, module end up weighing now that it's all done? I can pick it up by myself. That's pretty good. Yeah, it really should take two people because it's awkward, but I can, you know, move it around in my basement um, by itself. So like I said, I, I do a lot of details. Um, you know, to me, detail is what brings things alive on a model railroad. And I'm not really an operations kind of guy. I guess I'm <laughs> sort of more of an artist than I am an operator. <laughs> um, but, you know, someday I'll have a layout that I can actually run trains on other than four or five times a year. Uh, at train train shows. So this is the end of the Shelter Cove module and another corner module here, a little graveyard scene. This is, a lot of you probably seen Wicked Wanda's. This is Wicked Wanda's uh, <laughs> gradually decaying into the ground. And I, who was, somebody was asking about water, I don't, Dan maybe, or Tom, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's I cannot believe how smooth you have that there. <laughs> well, it's actually a lot easier to get it smooth than it is to get it to do other things. Um, I use a product called uh, it's by Unreal De Details, I think it's called Magic Water. Uh, I know a lot of guys use other things in Virotex, but the Magic Water to me is a great product. It doesn't stink. I can do, you know, water in my office if I want to on a module. And the the real key to doing good water, and maybe I, yeah, I got a picture here, is underpainting the surface in a way that gives you the illusion of depth. So I will start with, uh, you know, the, the soil surface kind of going down into the water. And then as the water gets deeper and deeper. I go almost to pure black uh, in the center. And this is Shelter Cove when it was in its initial form. And you can sort of see that here, how, you know, there's, this is just paint under about a quarter of an inch of surface, uh, <laughs> or of resin, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, I start off with a light brown color if I'm if I have uh, a shoreline, the shoreline, I, I bleed that sand material or soil material out under the water for a certain distance. And those are the pelicans that we were looking at before. You can kind of see right here, maybe a wire right here. But I painted it black to blend into the water surface. So going back to what Tom was saying, it's really easy to get a smooth surface. Uh, you pour the resin out and it, you know, with it dries smooth. Um, hopefully with no bubbles. If you're starting to get bubbles in it, you need to take a heat gun or a hair dryer and just run it over the surface and all those bubbles will go away. Do you do multiple layers or, cause it seems like quarter inch, uh, that, that could be a risk of a cracking or, or don't you have yeah. that, no? Never had that problem with that product I mentioned. Um, I don't think I've ever done multiple layers at all. These are all single pores. And I, I generally, the water is the very last thing I do on my modules. Uh, I mean, everything else, the scenery and everything, because what I want, like all these cattails and everything, I want the water to, I don't want them sitting on the water, I want them sitting in the water. Um, and all this algae and stuff that's, you know, applied afterwards, a little white glue and sprinkle on some ground foam and you're done. Um, I think the thing that's so scary about water is sort of like you're saying, you get everything done and then you're going to put the water in and you can, <clears throat> it might turn out just perfect or you might be totally screwed up and you'd have to go back and tear everything out again. That's what's scary. You're, you're right. You're right. Look at all, look at all this stuff, you know, all this stuff had to be detailed and the muscles on the, all these things had to be in before I poured the water. Um, so all that could be destroyed if the water goes bad, but I, I've never had a bad pour. The only thing that I have had is, you know, if, 
if you have pinholes in your base, it's really, really important that you uh, seal this perimeter as you're pouring because it's that, that resin is just like water. And if it finds a pinhole, it's going to go through. Hmm. And I had you called, you called it magic water? Yeah, it's called magic water. It's by Unreal Details. It's a great product. Do you seal this with uh, gesso? Uh, the resin, no, the resin's clear, but I'll tell you what I do do to get the, the texture is I use, um, what's it called? It's a Liquitex product and it is called... Uh, is this it here? Is this it here? So that, is this what you're talking about? Well, I'm Liquitex. talking about this surf. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's a it's a gloss gel medium. That's what it is. Right. Um, well, I I get okay water, but nothing as stunning as, as what you got. <laughs> well, that's a liquid product. I use a gel product. So when you pour that out of that that container, it pours out as a liquid. What I do is I buy the gel product and make sure you get the gloss medium. It goes on white. It looks terrible when you put it on. Uh, this, but it dries crystal clear. This is gloss medium and varnish, and it's white when you pour it out. It looks it looks like a real thin Elmer's glue, although it's it's real sticky. And the thing is, it's acrylic, so you can paint it out. But um, if you don't wash your brush out, that brush is dead. <laughs> yeah. um, but but the thing that is nice about this is you can put layer over top of layer over top of layer on it and it doesn't right. seem to have any effect. Well, the way to get texture on water, I, I agree with everything you're saying, Tom. Uh, the way to get texture on water though is to use the gel. Because if you pour that stuff on top of the resin, it'll just flatten out and you know it, it, it's hard to model. Uh, I just take a brush and I dab the surface of the water to create this ripple effect. And let's see on this one. You can see I've, I've did, you, did you do any test pours before you did your first pour ever just to see what the material behaved like and just kind of do a test before you did a, the actual first pour? No. <laughs> <laughs> you go right for it. Okay. <laughs> this this was my first pour ever. And I I was done with the module, everything was done except for the water and it was the very last thing I did. In fact, I think you can see. That was a real leap of faith. Yeah, I'm afraid so. You can see here, this is the module, everything's done. It doesn't have any water on it. So it's that, I was, I was terrified to be honest with you when I did the pour, but it worked out great. Yeah, what I meant by the uh, putting the gesso in there, I meant uh, before you even paint it. Is that how you uh, prepare the surface before you put the, the no. painting? No, I just use an acrylic paint and uh, uh, over masonite. This is just a masonite surface under here. It's quarter inch masonite, you know, screwed to the underside of the module. Um, and then I, point, I, though. To his point, you can use something like, if you go to Michael's, you can get this a golden gel. Oops, sorry. This yeah. is not going to mess with it, but it's thick. Yeah, that's, the, that's same really stuff, the same stuff I use, Andy. Yeah, and, and it works great. It'll dry just like that. And to your earlier, the guy's earlier question, no, it doesn't crack. It's, it's elastic. It'll stretch. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've never had any of my water crack at all, and, but I don't have huge surfaces either. I mean, this is the largest surface, and that's probably three feet by foot and a half, maybe, uh, at the far side. The Those waves did, look really good. Those waves, mm -hmm. they look nice. These are, the, because of that gel product that Andy was talking about, that's the same product I use, yeah. or similar product, you can build up the wave. So you, you just take a brush and you just, you know, add that gel and because it, it stays in form once you uh, put it put it down with the brush. So you can shape a wave easy. 
And then you paint it? Yeah, yeah I just dry brush the surface with a white um, acrylic. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. Same with these. I don't what do you use for a dam? Oh, sorry. I don't I paint any of the rest of the surface at all. It's just paint is only on the white caps. I do the okay. same thing with the waterfalls. Use this stuff, just paint it. I mean, literally paint it all the way down. Sure. What do you use for a dam at the edge of your uh, module? Oh, a variety of things. I've used uh, pieces of masonite, you know, just cut a strip of masonite and clamp it onto the face. I've used, I've got a metal uh, yardstick that I've used in the past. The, the key is to wrap that device, whatever it is, in saran wrap and then clamp it as tight as you can to the face of your module. Mm -hmm. um, some people say use a clear silicone to kind of seal that as just a real tiny bead. I've never done that. Um, just you can never. Use gel too. That'll do it. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. It will leak. It will flow out. Yeah, that's what I was saying. The pin, find a pinhole and it'll go through it for sure. And I do a lot of little water. I mean, there's, I do little puddles in the roads and little, you know, swampy spots. This is the remnants of a Bachman rail truck that I got so frustrated with, I turned it into trash. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You turned it into trash or it was already trash? Well, yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there's how I do the edge. Uh, I forget who was asking, but that's how I do the edge. And you don't put any caulk or anything. You just use a saran wrap essentially to seal it. Yeah, I, I wrap the, in this case, it's a metal straight edge. I wrap it in saran wrap. And I also lay saran wrap over the top because any kind of dust that gets on that surface uh, really screws up the look. Hmm. Unless, especially if it's going to be smooth. It's not so important if you're putting waves on it. Thank you. Sure. So just a couple more things here, and then I can show you some of the actual physical uh, models that I've done. These, I do a lot of people. You can see I'll do bulk. These are all the people for the uh, 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 port scene that I did. Almost every one of them is on that module. Uh, this is how I prime them, paint them. I do, a, I go blind painting these things. Um, these fish are cut out of just flat cardstock, and then I put epoxy on the top and paint over the top of it to get that look. I do a lot of signs. My sign, most of my signs are, um, I print, I, I either create them in Word or I'll pull something off the internet and I print them on photo paper and then I, um, sand the back of the photo paper down till all that's left really is the emulsion on the face of the uh, photo. And then I just use white glue and apply it over the whatever surface I'm on. This happens to be a, uh, a decal. Weathering is my thing. I love weathering stuff. Um, I use a rubber cement technique on most of my buildings to get peeling paint. I really like the way it looks and the way it turns out. Did that on, on both of these buildings. This is a model power, so you can see it here, model power uh, lighthouse that I cut down and modified, rebuilt the top of it, etc. And I use a lot of, of uh, Bragdon powders. I, I, I really love the Bragdon product, um, primarily because that's what I started using and learned how to use and have been using it forever. Um, but almost everything that I build is dusted in one way or another with, with uh, Bragdon powders to give it that dusty, weathery kind of look. Um, all these streaks on the roof, that's all done just with uh, with powders. 
same with this. This is all powder, rust, uh, rust color powder material uh, just applied over the surface of the paint. Do you uh, coat that with anything after you're finished, Kevin, the powder? I shoot it with the lightest dull coat shot that I can stand like three feet away and just missed it. Um, just enough to hold it. Generally speaking, the Bragdon stuff uh, adheres really, really well. I know other people swear by pan pastels and other things, but uh, the Bragdon stuff is, to me, is just excellent. And I don't, I don't own his stock in his company, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> For your dull coat, do you use a rattle can or are you using airbrush? No, I use a rattle can, but I, I, I just start the spray before I hit the model and continue spraying after I hit the model so I don't get those spatters that come from the can. The, the only challenge, and like this building right here, um, is... I used the peeling paint technique and I did do some Bragdon powders, but on this building I didn't overspray because if you overspray the glass, you end up with a cloudy glass. So I either have to protect it if I'm going to overspray or I don't overspray on a lot of things. I think that's the end of the slides. Is that the last thing you do with the model is go over it with a quick uh, spray of clear? It's not clear, it's dull coat. Um, dull coat, yeah. So it's, dull coat. It's, it's, I guess it is clear, but it's it's very matte finish. Yeah. Pretty much that's the last thing I do on everything. Yeah, Sean. I've, I've never done that before yet. <laughs> well, if you handle your models a lot, that's, that's one reason I do it is because, right. you know, these things are always coming on and off the modules. Every building has to come off and be put in a box and, you know, stored away. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid that the, the, the clear coat will ruin, not ruin, but change the way the model looks when I'm done. I'm like, wait, okay, it's done. Now I hit it with clear and then it changes it. It can. Uh, it, it can it can create a minimization of the powders that you're putting on. But I just go over it again. You know, just hit it with some more powder if I don't like what I see. Hey, Kevin, in those harbor scenes where you have the boats with the mast, do the boats lift off your layout or because um, you mentioned having a height requirement to transport these things? They do. Oh, let me show you. Uh, if you can, can you see my screen? Yeah, yes. we can see it. Yeah. Uh, here's my transport device for boats. <laughs> <laughs> There's three boats in there. And I just took uh, FedEx boxes and cut them up, and the boats sit inside. I don't know if you can see. So oh, they're that. just sit on top of the water, then. Yeah, they sit on top of the water. They're they're uh, they're not full hulls. They're waterline hulls. Mm -hmm. That was a fun exercise. If you guys ever have a chance to uh, collaborate with other people. Like I said, the one guy cast the hulls, Dennis Iveson. Um, Dennis Okamura did some of the uh, superstructure work. Um, I did some more of the superstructure work and then painted the uh, painted and weathered everything. Um, so it's, we do a lot of collaborative stuff on with the group that I belong to. It's not just you know all that stuff isn't just my work. Now with the boats, uh, is there like a like a footprint of where the hull's supposed to go? Yeah, what I did Ed, is is I took the boat. I had the hulls at the time. I didn't have the. They weren't finished. Um, so I took the hulls, wrapped them in saran wrap, set them in position, and then poured the acrylic around it. So there is literally a footprint for each one of those boats. So they. They feel like they're sitting in the water. And I do the same thing with buildings. You know, one of my pet peeves is, you know, people set their buildings on top of the soil and there's no foundation. There's no, you know, buildings sit in the ground. And uh, what I do is I'll set a building, I'll wrap it in saran wrap, literally. 
um, you know, take a take a building like this, I just wrap it in saran wrap, set it in, and then I, I pull the soil up around it. And it's, you know, before I glue it down. And then I just run around it with, uh, you know, a diluted white glue. And so the building has a place to sit. And it's in the same place every time. Uh, and it feels like it's sitting down in the, uh, in the ground, so to speak. Let me show you a couple other things here. Um, I'm not sure here if you can. S there, I set it to. I set that one to the primary video, so everyone. Oh, can see thank it. you, sir. Thank you. There we go. So this is that that uh, the color is not very good. It's actually a very yellow-looking building, but. That gives you some idea, I guess, of the kind of things that the rubber cement technique can do. And then down here along, along this edge, that's just the Bragdon powder, um, you know, rubbed along the base to show rain spatter and whatnot. Um, I do a lot of signs, you know, this, this building has a little bit of interior, which you can't really see at all. But obviously there's, you know, there's a couple signs in the windows. These are just hand painted, uh, hand painted signs here. And like I said, I do a lot of birds, put birds everywhere. <laughs> and, and bird poop. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's some more signs. You know, my objective is to make things look as, as realistic as I can. Um, given the, the limitations of, of models. You said you use the rubber cement to take the uh, paint off. Is, that, is there a certain length, length of time after you paint it before when you do that? Yeah, good, good question. Um, first of all, I put down a base coat, and usually it's just a gray primer. And sometimes I'll go over that gray primer with Bragdon powders to kind of turn the gray a little more brown. You could just pick a different color and go over it because I want that that sort of gray brown weathered wood look in you know in, in these areas right here where that paint peels off. When I, I let that set for quite a while, I'll let it set for maybe uh, two days so it gets really ultra hard. And then I'll go over it with the top coat. And typically, I will either airbrush or rattle can my buildings. These are all, most of these are, are sprayed. Um, and I let, because I'm painting with, I just use, um, you know, I'm using this kind of stuff. I just use Michael's generic acrylics to finish my models with. And, uh, so I'll, I'll paint the finish coat and maybe maximum, maybe 30 minutes later, I will go back with a rubber eraser and there's like a, what do they call them? Rubber cement erasers. I think I've got one laying here. We have a similar technique, evidently. Yeah, when you're good, you're good. And there you are. Now I'm on. Thank you. Well, let me get, I'm not muted. So anyway, I go back over it with a rubber cement eraser and it basically peels off as much as I want to peel off. Some places I just, just leave the rubber cement under the, under the uh, paint. It gives kind of a rough paint finish. I, I tried to do that technique with uh, hairspray and it didn't work out very well. With hair, yeah, hairspray is tough, I think. I, I don't like the hairspray technique. It's kind of finicky. Um, I also do a lot of, of uh, India ink finishes on my, for natural wood. Um, this is, I forget, I think this is a Banta kit. I can't remember who built, who makes this, but this is all just India ink stains and a little bit of um, uh, rust color paint to get to the finished product. It's really all it is. I don't know how many of you use the Indian ink finish for natural wood or aged natural wood, but I love it.
And then this is just another similar building. I don't know. I I light a lot of my buildings, so you can see this this particular building has a uh, uh, hearth or a uh, blacksmith hearth that is actually lit up with um, LEDs that flicker. And then I'm also doing uh, exterior. These are all operating exterior lights. And it's funny, this building also has an interior, but the interior stays on the module. So hmm. when, I, when I pull the building off, you're left seeing all the furniture and everything that goes inside the, the building. Um, I thought, you guys interested in seeing a couple, uh, some rolling stock and whatnot? Go for it. I'm all about the rolling stock. Excellent. Hopefully you can see this. Um, this is one of my logging chays. Uh, it's modified to some extent. It's a Bachman base, but um, I got this from Lynn Austin before he passed away, and he had started uh, really making some of the fundamental modifications. He had put a Climax boiler on a, on a shea base, and I kind of took it from there, um, changed the cab. The cab is all styrene uh, to, ref to give the perception of a metal cab. Uh, I raised up the fender on the, uh, the back because it, it just felt, it always feels too low to me. And I, I was really hoping for a, to get to a more, uh, chunky looking shea than what Bachman puts out. And I think it's pretty successful. I really, I, this is one of my favorite uh, locomotives. I also do a lot of, I put figures in almost all my ro locomotives. And I, these are also weathered very similar to how I do my buildings. I do a lot of, of uh, washes. I, I just, spray painted that this is a climax i'm working on so you probably can't see much difference i can but you probably can't between the these two surfaces but this is just kind of a generic black and the rest of it uh, i mean the the locomotive itself has got a whole wash of uh, rusts and browns on it that really change the quality of what it looks like um, so I'll do maybe three washes of a very, very light rust over the entire locomotive and then do specific washes like down in here. And I know you guys can't see this very well. I apologize. But, you know, down in areas like this where I've got a lot of rust hanging out. Do you do any airbrushing or do you all washes? Uh, the base is all airbrushed. Um, this is a locomotive that is hand painted. Turned out okay. Um, airbrushing just has a much uh, smoother surface to it. This is my very first dead rail locomotive and it's um, I don't know if you can, these things are really hard to show on screen. They show up way too dark. Um, but again, it's, it, you know, it's a base coat. I have a special mix. I do uh, a one to four uh, black to gray. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, one to three black to gray. So it's one part black to three parts gray uh, mix to get my base. And then I'll go over it with uh, a lot of washes to get the weathering effects that I'm looking for. I also do a lot of spend some time uh, cutting up little pieces of wood. I started buying this stuff initially uh, online. A gentleman was sitting around the coffee table at night, I think, chopping up little pieces of wood. And I said, well, I can do that myself. <laughs> I don't need to buy it. And Kevin, is the paint you're using on your locomotives, is that also acrylic? It's all acrylic, yes. 
I, I really started with acrylics and I really like them. Um, the only thing you have to watch for is drying time. Um, they can dry way too fast. And if you're in a sunny spot or something, but I use, I use a uh, inhibitor. I mix in an inhibitor, especially if I'm spraying uh, to give me the, a little more dry time. Another thing I do, and you guys cannot see this at all, I'm sure, just to tell you, is I take a pencil. You can't even see the rail on the screen, the handrail on the screen, but I take a graphite pencil and I highlight the edges of things where I think I would see metallic wear. Um, like this, you know, again, you can't see this, I'm sure, but. The front of the snow plow here has uh, that sort of graphite where you can, yeah, you can just barely, see. there you go. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, I take just graphite uh, either on my finger or from a pencil and I rub it on there to show metal wear. And it, it's a really nice effect. Do you have any recommendations or tips or, or, ideas to help someone who's never weathered uh, an engine before? I'm, I'm too scared to do it. <laughs> you know, Sean, you live like 10 miles away from me, so just come over and see me. <laughs> yeah, first, we'll do the first couple together. So I'll get the hang of it. You know, what I, what I would suggest really is um, try it on something you don't care about. You know, if you're going to spend 100 hours building a locomotive, you don't want to do your first weathering project on that locomotive. but you know, pick a junky little piece of Bachman stuff and, and play with it. Um, the other thing is weathering, do it in small steps. Um, you know, the way I do it, I'll do five or six washes to get the amount of rust that I want to see. I don't just try and do it all at one time. And the same with the, uh, same with the powders. I'll do I'll start with a light powdering and, you know, work maybe uh, two or three different uh, applications to get it to the level I want. If you go on heavy, you can't go, you can't back it up. Mm. So let me show you right. a couple more things. We're running out of time here. No. These are some other little weathering things that I've done. This is a regular Bachman shorty car. Um, the roof on this is all, this is a metal roof and it's, this is all just washes. Um, letting the, you know, laying that color in there and letting it pool and dry and then going back over it again and again. Um, I think you can also see here, I also, you know, put that graphite on the grab bars and and steps to show the show the, the wear from from use. And then this this is one of my favorite cabooses. This is uh, Cash Creek. Probably the first piece of rolling stock I ever built. Um, but again I use the rubber cement technique on this to uh, give it that you know beat up into the end of their line kind of look. Hmm. And then I, I also, the, the roof is dusted with the powders to give it, you know, to give it that dirty look. This is just uh, construction paper laid over the, the, the actual roof and glued on with white glue. Like that I get kind of anal about stuff like here. You, I don't know if you can see this, but I painted these yellow and then I rubbed off the yellow. So there's, you know, at one time when this was new, they had yellow grab rails <laughs> back in the day. But you can kind of see it there too. You know, a little bit of a little bit of paint left. So that's kind of it. I, I, I think we've kind of sucked up an hour of listening to me chat. You guys have questions, things you'd like to have me talk a little bit more about? 
Uh, have you ever done, uh, like, it seems that, I mean, this is just my opinion, is that, you know, you sort of like over weathered everything is, you know, as to make it to the end, you know, as you said, the end of the line type of look to it. Uh, would it be more realistic to be not to go that far? You know, sort of like peel it back off a little bit to make it look not brand new, mm -hmm. but also not like it's decrepit either. Sure. I mean, if, if that's the, it depends on the era and the condition of your line. You know, I like to model things as if, you know, this is a branch line or logging railroad that's almost out of business. Maybe, you know, they bought uh, uh, rolling stock and locomotives in the 20s and now we're into the mid 40s and the stuff's about done. Um, that's just what I like to model. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, the degree of weathering is is dependent upon what look you want to achieve. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way with my models. Like you said, they, it's the 40s, it's toward the end of the line, they're about to go bankrupt, they're trying to make do with what they have, and, and that's how I like the model as well. And it, that's strictly personal taste, uh, you know, as, as to and what what you want it to look like. Yeah, your uh, your equipment really looks like it's it's been working. <laughs> and, uh, it's been put to work, and <laughs> yeah, they haven't had time to, uh, to 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 pretty it up. What what, what is? I, I think Sean said it earlier in the in the day here. He said, "Put you know, rode hard and put away wet." You know. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, even class one railroads today have bridges on them that are over a hundred years old. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't like the background on your on your on your uh, screen there. <laughs> I, I was playing with that. And I just I tried it. Now, say this was like one of my rivers, and I'm done with rivers. I have no more rivers on my layout. But this is this is that Liquitex type thing. Yeah. Uh, and the downside to it is like if you try to to manipulate it or work it with it with a brush, uh, you can get a bubble into it. And if you have a bubble in it, you're you, you have to like literally drag that bubble out of it somehow and by doing that not create another bubble so right well, one one way to get bubbles out of the resin products is to use a heat gun not to be and, confused with a hair dryer which will just create dust well if you're in a dusty environment that's true yeah now how do you clean your water you know, after you have it all set up and all that, and you know, just keeping dust off and other, you know, just trying to make it not not to go beyond what you're planning on. I, I own stock in Swiffer. <laughs> 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 no, I, but I, I do. I just use a Swiffer and like that uh, that trestle view that has the really smooth water, I just take a Swiffer and dust it off every time I bring it out. Um, you know, my, my modules don't sit out like a layout would. They're in a trailer most of the time. I, I just, I see them five times a year basically. Um, so they, they don't get terribly dirty. So they, they make uh, they make Swiffer and O scale, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you can cut the Swiffer things in half, and it works just fine. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, are you recording this by any chance? I joined the meeting late. Don't worry, we don't worry, Rob. I've got it record. I've been recording since we started. Okay, so will you send it to me a link or whatever? Yeah, once we get, I'll send it to Jim so we can get the link up on the Facebook page. Okay. Um, shoot in chat shoot me your email and i can make sure you get it too okay i'll do it right now in the chat room yep just so i can save it into my email and once i, I once i send it to jim i can send it to you too thank you very much you know guys i don't i don't consider myself a particularly you know advanced modeler i haven't been doing this for very long and compared to some of the guys that are, you know, on this call. So, you know, I, I guess what I bring to the hobby is sort of an artistic sense, which comes out of my professional background. Um, you know, I, 
grew up painting and drawing and all kinds of things. So I get, I have a sense of looking at things, how they, how they represent in, as particularly in 2D, but you know, also in, in uh, 3D. So really, I think how things turn out. Yeah, so, um, I'm a photographer, so I'm looking at modeling like layering. You know, you're taking a flat dimension and making it layered looking, and that's what I'm seeing your techniques. You don't yeah. know the flat surface anymore. You think of it as layered, you know. Right. And and I don't, you know, I'm. it's interesting you're a photographer. I'm an amateur photographer, but that's my other, my other hobby is photography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm overboard in photography. I'm retired in it now. Yeah. But I like I, your work. Yeah, thank you very much. I um, have had a couple articles published in the uh, ON30 annual. I think 2016 and 2017, I had articles published. And all the photography in there is my photography. So. Mm. I don't think the people here want to listen to about photography. But you can always reach me. <laughs> if you like. <laughs> That's a whole different course. <laughs> so I guess, Kevin, let me ask you something. And pardon me if it's not coming across coherently because I'm thinking of this on the fly. Let's say, what would you say to somebody who's never done this before? Like, how would you give them that kick in the pants to convince them to try it? Because honestly, it's I, you and I both know it's not difficult, and it's just a matter of you need to put the time in to do it. So, what would you say to give somebody that kick in the pants? What I generally tell people is don't be a don't be afraid to screw it. You know, you gotta you gotta give yourself the opportunity to learn techniques. I didn't I didn't already know all this stuff when I started seven years ago. You know, I have the benefit of, I think, knowledge of color and the, the ability to kind of look at things as as Rob was saying through kind of a, a photographer's lens or trying to capture a certain look. But don't be afraid to try it. And if you are afraid, try these techniques on something that you don't really care much about. You know, take an old box car and play with it um and and i also would as i said earlier you know a light touch is better than a heavy touch um painting is, is painting is like watercolors and anybody who's ever done watercolors you know that's that's layer after layer after layer after layer of color applied to a flat surface and that's exactly what i do here um, I just doing it on a on a three dimensional form instead of a two dimensional flat surface. Sort of I don't like know if that answers your question or not. Sort of like raid the 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 bargain bin at the the model train shows. Absolutely, yeah. Go pick up a couple two dollar cars and and goof around with them. You know, try powders, try washes. Um, it makes a huge difference in how your how your uh, your rolling stock and everything looks. Yeah, the problem they say with um, potters like Pentel colors um, is that you you don't fix it on there, so people grabbing it will start destroying the textures and all. What's your opinion on that? Uh, you dropped in late. I think we talked about that earlier, Rob. But the Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I use, no, no, it's fine. I use a very light mist of dull coat over my finished products. So those those powders and those colors are pretty much locked in. I find that um, fixative, artist fixative for pastels. That works too. It's less yeah. destructive, but it still can be destructive. Yeah, the key is is holding your can, I mean, literally two and a half feet away from what you're spraying and, and just mist it. I mean, you, you don't want it. If it comes out wet, you've put too much on. You really don't even want to 
it, you want it to feel like you didn't get anything on the on the model. Mm. Um, yeah, you're dusting it. Yeah, yeah. literally. Mm. Hmm. Earlier, you were talking about you know how you do people. Do you do you also do like the birds and the animals also? Same thing. Yeah, I mean the the if you're asking how I do it, it's the same process. Gotcha. But all the like the little little pigeons. I don't know if you guys still can see this. Uh, Let me screen. put it. I'll put it up on the screen real quick. Oh, Kevin, I sent you my email address. Yep, I got it. So those little pigeons are all hand painted. They've even got red dots for eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You can, you can switch me back, Dylan. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, I use a magnifier for everything. I'm, I'm half blind without it, so uh, I use a magnifier for all the work I do, basically. I'm still, I'm still lucky I don't have any magnifying glasses or anything. I can still everything you do by my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are you, 22? I'm, I'm 29. <laughs> well, I'm 25, and uh, without these, you guys all look like blobs. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least you guys are doing O scale. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing you know, I, scale, so. huh? I started this off by saying I used to be an HON3, and I gave that up just because my eyes were so bad I couldn't deal with it. And I <laughs> do a lot more detail in O scale than I can in HO. Uh, those little ore cars I just threw up, those lose the N scale axles. I was like, nope, don't want to do this. <laughs> well, I, I wear trifocals and i doing N scale with Andy Zimmerman. And boy, challenges. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bless you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Well, I mean, how, what scales are people doing? I'm doing a HO scale. N scale. N scale. Mm. HO scale. HO scale here. All scales. <laughs> HO scale. N scale. I'm doing HO as well. S scale. You know, it's oh, interesting it's that the techniques that I've talked about really can apply to any scale. Um, they're not, you're not really limited. I think you just have to be a little, you know, when you get down to N scale, then it takes a very light touch because um, you can easily overdo it. Oh yeah, I think I've tossed, um, I've tossed many parts out just because I globbed it so bad that it's like, ugh. It doesn't take much to do it. <laughs> you, you're using camel hair brushes that only have like one or two little <laughs> hairs in it. I don't know if you guys have any of these, but um, you probably can't even see this. That's my best friend for applying CA glue. Yeah, the little pipettes. Where do you get those? Yeah. That, that actually looks like it would be kind of helpful. It's actually, it's not, it's not a pipette. It's actually a, almost like a needle that's split on the end. And so you can put a little bit of CA glue on it and um, it goes into the reservoir between the two split ends. Oh, wow. And yeah. you, you can apply microscopic amounts of CA glue to this. I use these a lot. What is it called or where, so we can order it? I think it's from Micromark. I don't remember what it's called. Um, this one, I've got two of them. This one is a uh, called a CA applicator. This one's by Flexifile. F L E X I F I L E. It's a CA applicator. I'm sure you can find them at like Micromark. You have to clean them uh, after you use it. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I wipe them off just so it doesn't get a buildup of CA. Uh, I just take a little alcohol and just clean it before it gets rock hard. <clears throat> I usually just put a little piece of wire, like oh, a 10 thou wire and a X-Acto handle. Yeah, that works. 
And I just anneal it first so it doesn't have much spring in it. I've heard people use, uh, take a needle and if you can grind the, the eye end off the needle, it's the same sort of principle. Um, and then you just, you can put it in a, in a uh, handheld vise or anything. That works the, good. The nice thing about like the needle or, or these devices is it has that little space between two tines. And that reservoir is what holds the glue. When, you, when you're using a piece of wire, you're getting a bead on the end of the wire. And sometimes that's too much. So. With, with this whole COVID-19 thing going on, it's kind of hard to find alcohol. So do you substitute like Jack Daniels or something? <laughs> 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 oh, no, vodka, vodka. <laughs> <laughs> if, you know, if you want funny. cheap alcohol, look for fireplace fuel. Yeah. Yeah. It's really I, uh, it's funny you say that because I bought three large bottles of ninety one alcohol right before this whole thing hit. So I'm I'm set for probably the next year. <laughs> <laughs> So Dylan, did I answer your question earlier? Pretty much. Okay. I don't have much more to say. I mean, I'm not I'm not one to uh, wax eloquent about myself. So. I'm really. I noticed there was a. I noticed there was a like uh, electronics in the back end of the the one locomotive. Uh, what was that? That's a blue rail board. Um, it's a dead rail board with a battery. Uh, it, I think Blue Rail, I know Blue Rail just came out with a brand new board. If you're into dead rail or want to try it, uh, it's a much better board than the one I have in, uh, in that particular locomotive. But with Blue Rail, you can literally run your locomotives from your phone. It's a, it's a Bluetooth communication and you just walk around with your phone and tell the locomotive what to do. Hmm. Does that have sound? That particular one does not have sound. The new boards have a sound module, uh, so you they can provide sound. Sound kind of sucks on the battery life, so I haven't tried it yet. I bought two boards just uh, so I could give it a try. I just I'm really into NCE, and that's what I know best, and so that's generally what I what I use. I'm using that new Blue Rails board for my smoke unit project coming up. Yeah, you're going to have to bring that over so I can paint it for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do those collaborations, so I appreciate you, you know, offering to do that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't kidding. He, I, I really will paint it for him. So. <clears throat> He's got a pretty neat, Sean came up with a pretty neat uh, arrangement for a smoke unit that really does the job it it creates a really interesting uh yeah. you can explain it better than i can but it actually chuffs rather than rather than just kind of a lionel stream of smoke coming out of the stack yeah so i'm waiting on the, a three volt fan i tried the 12 volt fan for it and it didn't work very well just it wasn't able to ramp up fast enough but the pwm signal is only too momentary so the yeah. 12 volt fan only just barely spun so i'm gonna put a, a three volt fan so when the three volt fan receives the 12 volt signal, it's just spinning up real fast. So I'm waiting on those from China. So that's the only thing holding that project up. Mm. It'll either do, it'll either spin up fast or burn up. One of the other. Yeah, one of the two. I bought eight <laughs> of them still. So. <laughs> and like, put a resistor I designed in it. the thing to be easily rebuildable. So and like I mentioned, we only we only run you know a few times a year. So that's the only place I'll I'll run it is at our shows. Yeah. No, that's, that's a neat, neat concept. I wish it could be scaled down even more, but it's uh, a great idea, Sean. <clears throat> well, Kevin, I want to thank you so much for uh, for doing this tonight. It's, sure. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a master class you gave us, <laughs> and uh, really can't thank you enough. Uh, tips and everything that you have that you can share. It's worth its weight in gold, no question in my mind. I'm always happy to share, and I, uh, if you guys have further questions or want 
specific information, just drop me a line. I'm on Facebook. I have a Pudding River Lumber Company Facebook site for those of you who don't know about it. Um, good way to communicate with me. Thank you for doing this and thanks to the others for putting this, uh, the technical part of this on. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank Dave, you very thank much. Thank you. Well, listen, next, uh, next Wednesday at seven, uh, Eric Deal uh, will be here. Uh, and uh, he belongs uh, to a club in Detroit that I was a member of 25, 35 years ago. Oof. So uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to Eric, and I think, uh, think you'll enjoy him very much. Guys, thanks so much for coming, and uh, see you Wednesday night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye.